What is up, Lighthouse Middle School students? How you guys doing? Hope you guys are having a fantastic Wednesday. We kind of just probably just got back from Thanksgiving, so I guys hope you guys had a, had a really great uh, holiday weekend, that you're excited to kind of get back into a regular school routine just for the next few weeks before we kind of get a little bit more time off for Christmas break. A um, couple of announcements before we get into our lesson for tonight. So first off, um, we have our end of the year pizza party. So we like to celebrate the end of the semester together at middle school. Uh, so what we're going to do on Wednesday, December 13th, so we're going to meet at church at 530. Uh, we're going to get in cars. We're going to drive to Indianola Pizza Ranch. We're going to get Pizza Ranch for dinner. I'll rent one of the kind of like the tiny little rooms that they've got so we can eat all together. Um, they've also got like one of the arcades there. So if you want to bring a little bit of money uh, and play some of the arcade games after we're done eating, we can do that. I would recommend bringing $20 um, so that we have about 15 for your meal and $5 for the arcade. And then we'll come back home. So it's just a fun way for us to kind of celebrate all the Fun that we've gotten to do together this year and all of the ways that you guys have grown. So uh, that's what we're going to do on Wednesday, December 13th. So that's in two weeks. Um, and another big thing that we have coming up is Winter Blast. So this is our middle school retreat that happens every year, end of January. Um, it's $134 and your parents should have like an email with all of the information about it. Um, but definitely don't miss it. Get it on your radar. Tell your parents you want to go. Um, registration is due January 11th. So uh, definitely sign up for, for Winter Blast. You're not going to want to miss it. It's awesome. And then finally, uh, of course, we've got our QR code for questions and answers with me. So this will be our first Wednesday back in the new year. I think it's January 3rd. Um, we will be at church. We will meet all together, and I will answer your questions about spiritual disciplines. Now, what is a spiritual discipline? You may be asking yourself. Spiritual discipline is any way that we carve out intentional time to be with God. Okay, so that could be reading our Bible, could be praying, could be gathering together in worship, uh, could be silence, or solitude, or fasting, or service. All of these things kind of fall under the umbrella of a spiritual discipline. So whatever questions you guys have about that, I'd love to answer. It's also on your note sheet. You'll be available for the rest of the lesson too. So go ahead, scan it, fill it out, um, and we can have a good discussion when we meet all together. So um, with that out of the way, let's get into our lesson for tonight. So, welcome to the first week of our new series called Grateful, okay? And the holiday season is here. Just had Thanksgiving, Christmas is here, right? Uh, we anticipate traditions, things like good food, no school, right? And of course, uh, the holiday season is filled with encouragements to be grateful, to be thankful. Thankfulness sometimes feels conditional, right? Sometimes if I get what I want, then I'm going to be thankful, or maybe a hard season to think of anything to be thankful for. Thankfulness doesn't always come easy to us. So let's go ahead and talk about it a little bit as we get into our lesson. So of course, we are all excited for the big day of Christmas, right? But I think there's some disagreements about what the best part of Christmas is. So I want to hear what you think, okay? Your options are the best part about Christmas is the food, the best part about Christmas is the presents, or the best part of Christmas is time with family. I'm going to give you guys 30 seconds. Pick your favorite. Say why. Ready, set, go. I was blind, now I'm seeing in color. I was dead, now I'm living forever. I had failed, but you were my redeemer. I've been blessed beyond all measure. I was lost, now I'm found. Now, during Christmas excitement, losing focus on what's most important and what we're really celebrating is pretty easy, right? Of course, presents and food make the holiday memorable but they can distract us from why we celebrate Christmas in the first place. We all know that we celebrate Christmas because of Jesus, right? Um, but you know what? Have you ever received a gift before and thought, now I have to do all of the work to put this thing together, right? 
Not all gifts are ready to go right away out of the box. Some require cooperation and effort to get the most out of them. And there's some children's toys that are kind of notorious for requiring complicated assembly. Most of these toys come with difficult packaging, maybe hundreds of pieces and instructions that kind of feel hard to understand. And before you know it, it's easy to feel like this guy, Matt, on Amazon, who's reviewing this um, little plastic tricycle. And Matt has this to say. One out of five stars. This is a nightmare to assemble. Seriously, an exercise in frustration. Start with lots of time and patience and expect to get very angry. This is one of those times I would pay more for a pre-assembled model. My son hasn't even seen it yet, and I hate it. <laughs> Sometimes a gift can be exciting, but the frustration of putting it together can distract us from being thankful, like our friend Matt here. Uh, in the same way, the work of the Christmas season, with all its gifts, people, time, and free time, can distract us from gratitude and purpose. So I want you to think about a time when your expectations for Christmas were set super high. Maybe it was a gift you were heavily hinting at, but you never unwrapped that one that you thought you were going to get. Remember how that might have felt? Maybe you had an expectation for everyone in your family to get along, but that didn't really happen the way that maybe you had hoped. Even though you received other great gifts and spent time with your friends and family, the result was maybe a little disappointing. How do we react when life isn't exactly what we would expect? Thankfully, there are many stories and passages in the Bible that are realistic about the ups and the downs of life. And one of the places that we find that kind of stuff is the book of Psalms, which has a variety of poetry and songs written about love and thankfulness, but also disappointments, difficulty, hardships. And Psalm 80 specifically is about asking for God's help. So if you're in this Bible, it's on page 373, big number 80, starting in small number one. The psalmist says, Please listen, O shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph's descendants like a flock. O God, enthroned above the cherubim. Cherubim is a, is, is a name of some of the angels, okay, a spiritual being. Um, display your radiant glory to Ephraim, Benjamin, and Manasseh. Show us your mighty power and come and rescue us. Turn us again to yourself, O God. Make your face shine down upon us. Only then will we be saved. O Lord God of heaven's armies, how long will you be angry with our prayers? You have fed us with sorrow and made us drink tears by the bucketful. You have made us the scorn of neighboring nations and our enemies. They treat us as a joke. Turn us again to yourself, O God of heaven's armies. Make your face shine down upon us. Only then will we be saved. So the psalmist here, of course, is crying out for God's grace and peace and love to be present with the people in distress. They pleaded to be restored and saved by God. And it's a prayer that honestly for them required waiting. Many psalms include the, include the theme of waiting and hoping that God will act. But just like the night before Christmas, waiting can be a little challenging. And this posture of waiting it is what God's people did for years as they were waiting for the person that scripture had promised, the Messiah, the promised one. Powerful people had oppressed them for years and they longed for God to send someone to rescue them. Think about how difficult that waiting time was, just waiting and patiently waiting for the Savior that God promised for them for hundreds of years. And God's people have been waiting for a Savior to come and make things right for them. For centuries, they were under the control of foreign governments and rulers. They had to leave the land where their ancestors lived, and they were considered second-class citizens. Finally, after many years of waiting, like I said, hundreds, God enacts this plan to make things right through one of God's people, a young girl named Mary. So let's read some of her story. This is in the New Testament on page 636. We'll start... Um, Small number 26, and we'll read to 38, and then we'll move forward a little bit to verse 46 and read through verse 55. So in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a village in Galilee, to a virgin named Mary. She was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of King David. Gabriel appeared to her and said, Greetings, favored woman. The Lord is with you. Confused, disturbed, Mary tried to think what the angel could mean. He said, don't be afraid, Mary, the angel told her, for you have found favor with God. 
he will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be very great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. Mary asked the angel, How can this happen? For I am a virgin. And the angel replied, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the baby to be born will be holy, and he will be called the Son of God. What's more, your relative Elizabeth has become pregnant in her old age. People used to say that she was barren, but she has conceived a son and is now in her sixth month. For nothing is impossible with God. Mary responded, I am the Lord's servant. May everything that you have said about me come true. And then the angel left here. Okay, moving down a few verses to starting in verse 46 now. Oh, how my soul praises the Lord and how my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. For he took notice of this lowly servant girl. And from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one is holy and he has done great things for me. He shows mercy from generation to generation to all who fear him. His mighty arm has done tremendous things. He has scattered the proud and haughty ones. He has brought down princes from their thrones and exalted the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away with empty hands. He has helped his servant Israel and remembered to be merciful. For he made his promise to our ancestors, to Abraham and to his children forever. So Mary is receiving this amazing, terrifying, wonderful, shocking news. The long-awaited news that her people had been praying for was here. But this probably wasn't the way that she expected it to happen, right? The plan for the world would require a significant amount of sacrifice on her part. It would turn the world as she knew it upside down. And you might think that her response would be outrage and disappointment, like how Buddy responds to the fake Santa in the movie Elf, if you've ever seen that movie. But instead, Mary's reaction was surrender and a song. She sang a song of thanking God for remembering her people and allowing her to play a role in the great plan. Now we can imagine, of course, that Mary was confused and afraid. She was young, so she most likely hadn't gone through many life-altering experiences, especially like this one. She was probably worried about other people's reactions and responses to her pregnancy, especially her fiancé, Joseph, right? But in that moment of confusion and fear and loneliness, Mary chose to sing about the good things that God had done. She showed the world that we can be thankful for all that God has done, no matter what the circumstance. And she sets just an incredible example for us and for so many people. Uh, when she faced this difficult journey. She didn't focus her song or words on how difficult it was going to be. She focused on who God was and what God had done. She remembered and listed everything that God had done for her and her people. And because of God's faithfulness, Mary could trust God and be thankful for the coming salvation through her son, Jesus. And you and I might have long and complicated journeys ahead of us. But like Mary, God changes our lives through Jesus. And we can be grateful for God's work. Mary helps us see that we can be thankful for all that God has done. Now, of course, it's easy to say that we should be grateful for what God has done in our lives, but it can be hard to remember that truth, especially in moments of disappointment. So when you face setback, trusting God in that moment can be tough. But if we keep our perspective on God's goodness in good times, then we might be more prepared to see God in those tough times Two. So one thing that we can do is we can choose thankfulness daily. A research professor interviewed 11,000 people, okay, about the subject of joy. And the professor asked everyone about their experience of joy, and he concluded not one person who described themselves as joyful did not also actively practice gratitude. So gratitude is powerful in helping us to be joyful people. Although one bad situation may t- take up many of your thoughts, maybe do what you can to try and count, um, you know, two, three, maybe even ten small good things that you can be grateful for each day. And then thank God for those things. And of course, we can remember what God has already done. Even though you guys are all pretty young, I bet that you have maybe had some tough circumstances. Uh, There's obviously, we don't need to compare each other's situations, right? But think back on how much has changed from before the tough time to now. That is evidence of God being a part of your life. It may be hard for us to see, but God 
he is at work. And noticing what God has done in our past can help that we help us to trust God in the future, trust that he will work in our lives moving forward. And if you're having a hard time of thinking of something, we can always remember that God sent his only son because of his great love for us to save us from our sins. And that is worth being grateful for, especially as we think about the Christmas season, right? So like Mary, we may have some unanswered questions and some hurdles that we might have to face, but we can respond differently just like she did. When gratitude for who God is and what he has done in our lives remains our focus, it's things that we focus our attention on, we can grow into people who are peaceful, who are trusting, and even hopeful. Even in our most challenging circumstances, we can be thankful for all that God has done. All right, that's what I've got for you guys this evening. Uh, I love you guys. I will see you when I see you. I've been given a hope and a future. I've been blessed.